want of the audience, you can probably tell them apart. Uh, Pavla Kakova in Prague, um, there at Investigates. Is that, am I pronouncing that right, by the way? No. <laughs> how, do you, how do you pronounce it? I, uh, Holcova. Holcova, okay. Investigace. Thank you. I'm terrible at pronunciation. And No uh, worries. Uh, we just call her Pavla because she's like Madonna or um, Brittany. Queen. She just needs, just needs one name. And then Stevan uh, Dushinovic. Close, you know? Dojcinovic. Yeah, I was close. I was close on close. that. Uh, and again, uh, around OCCRP, there's only one Stevan, so we, we never use his last name. Uh, these two spent um, most of their adulthood, I think, looking into this group of uh, 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 organized crime, cocaine traffickers, drug smugglers, assassins, and general ne'er-do-wells who came to be known as Group America. And they spent years tracking this organization and then in uh, September, early September, published a series of articles that uh, gained a lot of attention. Um, um, and I'm sure we're pretty well read in parts of Prague, New York, and 27 other countries where the gang operates. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Tell us how you got started on this and how you kept it going for so long without losing interest or, or just like uh, wandering away. Well, uh, I guess I will start because, um, um, yes, uh, this particular story, or actually series of stories, uh, we have been working for, I even, I don't, cannot recall how many years. So we can say from maybe, how much, maybe like five, seven to 10 years, approximately. We're not sure, um, because this is the first time actually we faced this kind of the problem. When we start um, investigating particularly this gang that some of the stories you can do for your whole life they will never really end because there was so many it was international organized crime group that was like smuggling cocaine who operates in three or four continents and dozens of countries and then when we actually start investigating from leaders and then we want to investigate each of the member and each member have some of the cases in some of the country when he was arrested or some drug was seized. And then we understood that if we really investigate every single case connected to this group, maybe we will not finish in our lifetime. So actually uh, this investigation uh, in one moment becoming so complicated that even we got uh, stuck into what we found. And actually in the end, uh, 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 one of the hardest thing actually to, uh, to to do in this investigation to really understand when it's time to stop and publish what you have. Um, but uh, yes, actually, uh, I mean, it started as a, like some regular investigation to organized crime. So we have some case about some uh, narco group, which operates in smuggling cocaine from South America to Europe. And it, these people originate from Balkan. And uh, uh, they have some connection in Czech Republic in Slovakia. And this is the reason why I started actually uh, analyzing this group and then I contact Pavla in Czech Republic. We already uh, worked together on some of the stories and I told her these guys could be interesting guys. So can you start checking them? And then in the beginning, it looked like something which will fairly, pretty fastly finish. But actually as longer we investigated this group, we start revealing some of really hardcore mysteries about this gang and we understood very fastly that this will take a while actually to finish the, 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 the whole thing. And then in the end, we really got stuck in, I think at least seven years of really effectively working on these stories. So maybe Pavla can bring some- Okay, I can, I can continue, right? Okay. So actually for me, it started when, when Stevan uh, sent me something like 20 names and I started to check them and, and I found the connections and links to Slovakia, not so much to Czech Republic. And that's how it started. And because it's always good to, to, to do stories with Stevan because it's going to, be, going to be hardcore organized crime, then I agreed, but I didn't know by the time that it's going to take like five years probably of my life. <laughs> but also uh, create right, like 
like really really good experience and and really good stories as well it's just you know i, I was just disappointed that it's touching czech republic only very remotely what um what made these guys so fascinating that you were willing to devote this kind of time what makes them different than any other cocaine trafficking ring uh, well i mean for sure it was their connection that they have so it was maybe the best well connected group that we ever faced and when i say connection i think the connection inside of the government and with the law enforcement structure and this is what makes really these guys tough because they're really well connected in several countries mostly with uh, intelligence services this is this kind of most mysterious part about the gang which actually hooked us to look look deeper and more um, inside of the gang and i think that that is kind of flavor of this particular gang was this connection they have established with law enforcement well for, for me it was uh for the first time i could see that like really a uh, top-notch organized criminal group really smuggling tons and tons of cocaine is having one of the bases in slovakia in bratislava now, you guys uh, did a lot of research on this, which, which included actually traveling to South America and uh, especially Peru to track these guys down. And, and Pavla, you did something a little unusual that I'm sure your mother just didn't really want to hear about. Can you talk to us about what you did to, to get the story? Yeah, we actually, when we, we, we got approval from our boss that we can travel to, to Peru to try to collect some materials about Grupo America because they are number two, like the, the second most important man of the group was just arrested, not just, uh, he was arrested. And uh, we understood that there must be a case uh, when that, that we can get some insights from how they operate in South America. So we went there and we got, uh, we spent only about five days there, but we got better and better data and information each day. So at the end, we decided that we will try to do interview with Zoran Jakšić, who is this Serbian guy who is recently in, in jail in Peru. And the only possible way how to do it, because the, the official way to ask, you know, as a media request interview and so on, it would take too long and we wouldn't manage to, to, to catch our planes. So we decided that we will just go there and because there was a visiting day for, for women. Uh, so we had this idea that I will dress as a prostitute and we will go and visit Soran in, in his cell and just, you know, uh, ask him for an interview. What actually happened at the end? And my mom didn't know. <laughs> um, and he did not know you were coming. You were a surprise to him. I was surprised. I, it, it only came to me, you know, when I was somehow thinking about the visit my idea was that what i know from movies so that i will come to the room and there will be this thick glass and we will speak over the phone and there will be guards everywhere the, the reality was quite different um when i entered the jail uh the, the feeling was that actually the the, the jail was ruled by zoran Jakšić. so i was uh taken to his cell by someone who, who, who was acting as his servant. And uh, then I knocked on the door and waited. And then, you know, first thing that, that surprised me was that he was actually living in a cell that was locked from inside, not from outside, but it's kind of unusual for prisoners. And then he didn't know I was coming. So he was asking, who am I? And, and what the hell I'm doing there. And why, when I told him that I'm a journalist and I would like to talk to him to interview, he said that he hates journalists. So I offered him that we can talk about whatever. And then we spent about four or five hours talking about actually Seneca because he was just reading Seneca and, and uh, other Asian philosophers. And what just came to my knowledge recently, uh, we spent part of the time uh, having tea and a coffee in the cafeteria in the yard of the prison. 
and only recently the police discovered that right you know in this area there was one of the ends of the tunnel Zoran Yakšić uh, was uh, not really building but paid for building that should probably help him to escape from the prison so th there was a tunneling effort to get him out yes and i believe it was 180 meters were dug out of 300 meters needed to reach the place where you were in interviewing him yes that's what yeah. i understand but it was interdicted beforehand and he was moved to another prison where what's happening to him now uh he because there was a knowledge that he wants to escape. They transfer him to, to maximum security prison, uh, Piedras Gordas, uh, at the north of Lima. And he's spending his time there now. But uh, this tunnel, it was not the only option. He was betting on how to get out of jail. So he hired one of the best lawyers there is in, in Peru, who is expert on procedural mistakes in the in the judicial process and he succeeded uh, and he's getting retrial <clears throat> sorry what means that he will uh, be released to uh, house arrest soon now checking yourself into a prison is kind of dicey um, chasing around people who have been known to use chainsaws on their competition and, and informants is dicey uh, did you guys ever fear for your safety in all of this? And are you still taking precautions about that? Well, uh, it's very difficult uh, when you investigate organized crime. It doesn't work really in a way that you really at every moment to really know are you and how much in the danger. It's more difficult. So uh, usually, like, I don't know, if you investigate some uh, smaller groups or hooligans, these people can uh, threat you or do some moves which you understand is a potential danger. But when you really investigate organized crime, like international, big, big, these big players are not the ones who will like send some threats before they do something uh, or give you any kind of signal that you really understand. So it's more on you that through all information you have, basically you try to evaluate is there danger or not, right? And understanding who are the people who investigate um, uh, and how they react in some other cases, we kind of make some evaluation that we are in kind of in the middle, in not completely, let's say, safe zone, but we also don't, doesn't think that we are something really in some great danger at this point. And then when this happens, you kind of, you need to do uh, and make some restriction in your life. Like, uh, you know, you will, uh, for instance, stop going out and getting drunk uh, till six in the morning in the clubs, right? So uh, the point is, if you think that uh, basically it's not completely uh, uh, a safe atmosphere and that potentially something can happen, then journalists who work on organized crime stories need to really adapt to the way of life that for some period of time they will make some restriction in their life. It must be done this way. Okay. We have a question from the audience. I'll go ahead and read it says, I would like to know, uh, when doing research about stories in general, where do you start? Old school face-to-face -face talk and contacting uh, to the connections, or, do you, or can you find valuable information in the internet or social media? Hmm. Um, should I start? So I think it depends also the country, right? Uh, in the, some countries which they have more transparency, better uh, public registers and uh, information are more transparent, I guess. There's more stories that you can only from internet get. In my country, in Serbia, it's not transparent so much. So many stories actually get from the sources by talking face to face. Pablo? Yeah, uh, depends on the story, but I usually really start with Google because quite often uh, you can find that someone already covered at least uh, some parts of the story. You, you are quite often starting to investigate and there is plenty of, of information in the uh, public databases that you can access in Czech Republic or Slovakia. So that's, I usually start and actually those face-to-face -face talks 
uh, it comes rather at the end uh, because you also need to talk to, to, to the people you are writing about, people from organized crime. So uh, it's not advised to start with it because uh, it could uh, put you in risk. Again, to the audience, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have questions. Uh, while we're waiting for those to come in, let me ask you this. You, you, were, you worked on this for literally years. How did you keep track of everything? And were you always able, were you so organized that you were always able to put your hands on things that you needed? And how much stuff did you amass as you were going? Like we, we, we collected like gigabytes and gigabytes of, uh, of documents. And, and it means those were like thousands and thousands of pages. And we did not kept, you know, at some point, at the beginning, you always try to, to have it well organized, you know, to, to navigate through your archive in, in a good and smooth manner. But at some point, it just broke because when we were in Peru, we got access to the uh, uh, police file of this case that happened in Peru. And we took pictures of, of the pages of the police file, what at some point meant that we've got something like 8,000 uh, pages of a text, but in a format of a photo. And that was probably the point when, when our organized archive started to be disorganized because it was impossible to, to uh, you know, just make sense of, of all those pages that were in, in JPEG. And only later we adopted some technologies to, that helped us to, to, to navigate even through the photos of the text, but it was only later. Stevan, any, any helpful hints for people uh, undertaking something of this magnitude about how to go about it? What, uh, what pitfalls you uh, either fell into or avoided? Well, uh, it's really important to organize all your information. So like Paula said, for a few years we had it well organized, but then we got lost in all the information. And the reason was because this happened in a period when this technology was not so advanced like today. But I think today, if you do this kind of story, you can really from the beginning to the end to really uh, uh, make, uh, you can sort your information not to get lost. So I think this is really important because every day, uh, information will just grow when you investigate this because you start from the leaders of the gang and then you investigate every single another member of the gang and every next week or day will add you some new names which you will investigate and bring new names and bring new cases so it's really it can become really messy second thing is you should always think when you're going uh, when you investigate organized crime it's not like you're doing story on corruption and the biggest difference is that these stories are pretty uh, tough to do in terms also of security and the most important element there is to try to do the stories in a way in your research that nobody really can discover what you're doing so it's not like nobody but of course not the people who you investigate because in the moment they they start realizing that you investigate them you are already in potential risk so you should think in a way how not to really so easily give, give your information what's uh, what's going on and you should always try first to talk with the sources that you can trust from the police and so on. Because also police, like in this case, can be corrupt and connected to these guys. So like being careful, I think, uh, for this kind of story, it's actually most important. And you should uh, learn a lot about the mentality of these guys. Because every organized crime group is different depending from the area they're coming. Uh, and uh, it's completely different the way how they operate and mental structure of Yakuza members, then like Balkan organized crime, then uh, even Italians or South Americans or some gangs in Europe. So what do you want to do? You really want to understand how these guys really think and behave. And this for sure will actually help you not just to be more safe, right? Because you can uh, at least estimate what they can do, but also uh, you, you will better understand the moves they were making when you investigate. So you understand why some particular things actually happened. What would you say was the, the, the single hardest thing about doing this story? Uh, me, so I think uh, 
we didn't manage really to prove everything. So the hardest thing was actually to prove these last bits. And actually what was uh, for me the hardest thing to do actually is to prove these connections with law enforcement. That was the hardest actually to provide evidence. It was much easier uh, to provide evidence from drug smuggling and other things, but this was really hardcore. And we, I think we managed to provide enough of the evidence to show connection between this gang and Serbian law enforcement. But what we knew very early that also they had some connection in US, but, and actually we managed to find some circumstances evidence to, sh to present them in stories so readers can have this conclusion, but I don't think that we enough actually get real evidence to prove also this connection in US. And I think this was maybe the weakest part there. Pavel. And of course, yeah, what, what, what was really, really challenging was the final fact checking. Uh, each story we do uh, must be fact checked. And uh, if you are writing about organized crime, it's really difficult, you know, to, 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 to pass it through fact checking because you are talking to the sources that you can't name, you can't record. And the only thing you can do is to scribble the notes on a paper. And sometimes the fact checkers, they are not happy that they don't see any recording, they don't see any pictures that you are actually talking, and they can't verify that uh, the meeting with the source really happened. And so the, the only the fact checking of, of the stories took something like three months, I guess, something like this, and, and it was really thorough, but we managed, uh, so, so yes. This was challenging for me. I think it felt like three months, but it wasn't quite that long. <laughs> but it was it was difficult, and in part because you collected so much material over so many years, and getting it together to show to the fact checker was a daunting task in and of itself. Um, and being better organized all through probably would have made that go faster, but I'm not sure that uh, the fact checkers would have been much better just because of the nature of the, the material. Now, what has happened since publication? Um, other, than, other than everyone now admires you for your work, what's been the response? And have you heard anything at all from the shadowy figures who run Group America uh, from a house in uh, New York City that we actually went and looked at? I mean, they didn't give any response to us, right? Of course. And usually these guys don't do this thing that they don't comment your story. But we get a lot of uh, different comments from, for instance, from different police officers from different countries uh, about the group. Uh, I think uh, we get pretty cool comments from uh, Italian cops, from Peruvian later. Um, uh, we also even get some uh, information context from some other, uh, 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 let's say, uh, members of underworld who also kind of send us some information regarding so the story made a lot of a lot of uh, uh, impact in that way but we didn't get any kind of really response from them the people who we investigated uh, and usually this is not something that with this kind of big these guys big like this they don't really want to communicate much and and talk with you and actually what pavla did in prison was pretty miracle it was really one of rare situation that you have this kind of big important player to really even talk with you right this is really 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 crazy he had nowhere to escape <laughs> by <Yeah>. then <laughs> Pavla, how about how about you have you seen much reaction uh, no because it didn't concern czech republic that much but i what, what i can see as an impact what is kind of typical for for the region of central europe that some of the people started to talk about the possibility that the organized crime may be present even in Central Europe. You know, the, the, somehow this issue is, is widely ignored in Central Europe that we have, you know, different mafias operating in this region. And I'm happy that those stories, at least from a part, uh, brought, shed some light on, on the fact that it's really happening and also what what uh, we did with the uh, colleagues in Slovakia, we shed some light on a, on a story a couple of years old, and it actually seems that some of the cocaine uh, that was uh, 
seized by Slovak police uh, and, you know, during a big, uh, big ceremony burned and destroyed, was actually sold uh, later by the Slovak police uh, who, who served as the dealers. And most probably this cocaine belonged to, to Grupo America. And one, Another one, more nice, okay. one more nice reaction is also that we were uh, also contacted by various people from entertainment industry. So there is some plans <laughs> to try to turn this into TV series, really. So we got even some producer contacting us. So I, uh, that, that's not so bad impact. Narcos Belgrade. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have another question from the audience. And again, a reminder, if you have a question for the panel, the Q&A button at the bottom sort of center right of your screen. Um, this question regarding the stories about the organized crime groups for corruption related to governments. How do you, you usually approach the people close to the officials or criminal groups to get information? Do you advise it at all? And who is the most reliable source in these kinds of stories? especially if the journalist is banned from traveling to the country in which the story is, is uh, happening. Mm, well, we didn't have this case that we were banned uh, in any country. I mean, I am actually banned in two countries. <laughs> I'm banned in Russia and United Arab Emirates, so I literally cannot enter. But uh, fortunately for this story, we didn't need to, to travel there. So the countries we traveled, we were not banned. We didn't have this... Uh, uh, um, uh, Experience, but even if we were, I guess we will do what we always do. We will rely on some local help. So, for sure, we will find. If we cannot physically go there, we will find some uh, journalists, local journalists, who can help us. And I mean, that's the whole point of our network, right? That we can easily have access and find these people. And uh, rest of the question was about how to find sources, right? As no, it was about how how to approach for a comment if you are investigating corrupt government officials. Mm, that's very dangerous and very tough. And yes, uh, it is unsafe generally to do this. Because in the end, you, in the end, it's like in this movie, you cannot trust anyone. So even, you know, if you talk with the police, it can be people working with them, government officials can be corrupt working with them. So the only what I can advise, if you need to talk with these people, and you need, so of course, through this investigation you talk with the people who were connected to them is that you need to mask what you do so you don't call them to talk about this gang right so you find some other topic why you're talking with them and then through some other uh, uh, conversation you actually slowly in a bit you're approaching and actually asking questions about this group so basically you work in a way to hide that this other person doesn't really understand what is the focus of their work. And you don't want to let them know that the, this group is focused because potentially be, uh, they could be connected. This, this was some kind of approach I'd had with some sources here in Serbia. Another question, how did you learn to think like a gangster? What was most helpful for you to get this skill? I think that's probably for Pavla. Oh, he we... thinks like a gangster. <laughs> You actually need to do it. Uh, for me, it was like at the beginning, I didn't, uh, when I started to work with Stevan, and Stevan is like really uh, expert on, on thinking like a gangster. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, what he's talking about. So I was reading a lot about organized crime and I was not only reading, you know, the, the pop literature or you know, watch those uh, funny movies about organized crime. I was also reading books that uh, I never used this experience, but those were plenty of, for example, reports written by, uh, by Serbians on Kosovo organized crime. So at some point I was really expert on, on Kosovo organized crime and, and who was who in the Kosovo wars for independence and, uh, by that you learn a lot. Also, it's good to 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 visit or know the countries where, where those groups are coming from to to understand their motivation or their frustration and and the reasons why they entered this this part of a let's say business or industry. Stefan, how did you go gangster? Well. Uh... 
uh, I learned by work. So basically, uh, I was first doing some more light stories, and through them I approached to the first people from the underworld. Uh, and actually, by looking at them, listening to them, I, this is one of the, the ways how I understand how they really think, how they behave. And also, like Paula said, I was reading a lot original source, so not uh, not movies, not books, because this is all fiction. People think like, uh, for instance, um, a Netflix series like um, Narcos is a fiction in the end, okay? Uh, people too much believe that it's actually factual. Yes, some immense are. And I think the really way much better to learn about this criminal is like original like sources, like uh, police files, police records, court records, the same things like Pablo was reading, is that basically you really read their quotes. Uh, you, you read the transcripts of their phone conversation. This is the way how you can really approach them. Or, of course, personally talking with them. Because in the end, you need to see the way how they think and they think differently than us. And they think they are some other world. Many of the criminals will say in our world. So they completely see us as some completely different universe than them. And there is some other rules and the way they think it's completely different. So yes, you really need to study this, to really get into this mindset. Um, one of the things about the, this investigation that really marked it it was a, a real cross-border effort and each of those countries presented a different challenge which ones were the easiest ones to work in and which ones presented problems and what were those problems i think uh, me and paula will agree that peru was the easiest one yes in a way uh, getting information the police and everyone there was so open like I don't know, we were there like five days and we got all files from police, courts and everything. Uh, uh, Italy was really bureaucratic nightmare because in Italy, it's really, you don't know who's responsible for what. But we luckily, we had there uh, some good cops who were giving us files. Uh, and basically, in Serbia, it was not so easy. And you were always under some uh, paranoia. And I don't know what um, maybe Paolo can add. Uh -huh. Well, in Slovakia, it was in, in Slovakia, it was quite difficult because everyone was like, what are you talking about? It was the same case in Czech Republic, like what group, what is Group America? You know, we, we are talking about Balkans and, and uh, I'm afraid even the law enforcement quite often see uh, different Balkan criminal groups as, as one criminal group. You know, those are the Balkans, but, but those are different groups that operate in a different style and 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 it's very short-sighted to call them like oh those are the balkans and and see them as one group so so yeah even if you approached some of the guys who should know about the the operations of this group um it was not very uh enriching conversation um and uh, now it's, it's, it's interesting go ahead. was also us was actually pretty hard for this story in us it was hard to get some files even some basic documents that was kind of also weird why is that weird because i always found in some other stories it was more transparent in a way we really managed to get more records from us and here for instance we couldn't even uh, get if one uh, indictment which is by all means public document which was indictment from 2003 about this group even today till today we didn't manage to get a copy of this file for me that was really crazy one of the elements what's what steph is talking about here is that uh one of the leaders if not the top leader of group america lives openly in new york city and um that was always a question of how he could do this even though he had been indicted uh, for drug trafficking several years ago and that case is still open um this sort of played into the narrative of the story as a lack of information became an element a, a kind of a clue of of proof of a connection yes. um, and we were never able to get that well we've reached the end of our time it's uh 40 after the hour thank you so much for joining us everyone all 33 people out there in the audience and Stevan and pavla okay thank, thank you. you and you just always need to be careful when you're doing these stories 
I mean, we're doing so for so many years and we are considered as an expert of organized crime, but there's so much we need to learn. And you should always be actually careful when you're doing this. Okay. Dagmar, back to Thank you. Bye-bye.